We have a Connect With Us number, 574-465-6545. Please feel free to text us any prayer concerns, any comments. Uh, if you want to connect with us, we just want to welcome you and get to know you. This morning, our moment in mission is Sylvan and Connie Aish with Time to Revive. Uh, Sylvan and Connie were going to be with us here this morning. They actually uh, went with another couple they know to a funeral. They're out of town this weekend, so we'll have more from them the next time. Uh, but right now, what we want to remember is that what Sylvan has asked us to talk about is what he has in the bulletin, the Revive School. You know, through the challenges of the last year, Revive has found new ways to reach people. And through Revive School around the world, Sylvan told me last night they have now reached approximately 4,800 students in 39 countries. They're doing this by sending boxes to these schools, uh, which contain a computer with their, with their Revive School loaded on it, projector, books and supplies, and then they support those schools. So we just want to remember them as they, uh, and they're now in the beginning stages of translation to enter even more countries. So you'll be hearing more about that in the future from Sylvan. But right now, we just want to remember Revive School. Um, as we go to prayer, we also want to remember the requests in the bulletin. Ken Overmeyer and Carl Miller. Uh, we also remember Del Slaybaugh. Um, who is experiencing ongoing health issues. I mentioned Sylvan and Connie are gone. This week, Selena Romero's mother passed away in Puerto Rico. Uh, Carlos and Selena are there along with Sylvan and Connie. And uh, many of us know Carlos and Selena. They were part of our congregation for a long time. Selena was part of our church staff for many, many years, so we just want to remember them and the death of Selena's mother. We also want to remember Oliver Yutzi's family. Uh, the, the celebration of life service will be this afternoon at two o'clock, and the family is all gathered here in Indiana for that service, um, for Oliver's passing. So we just remember Miriam, Randy and Barb and their family and all of their siblings that are, and grandchildren that are here. At this time, I want to ask those of you who may have a prayer request, an unspoken request, something happening in your life or going on this week, uh, to stand. And if you're at home, we want to remember you as well. If you have those requests, we're going to be praying for you as well. And as we look around us for those, just remember those uh, in prayer, who have those unspoken requests. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Lord God, our Father, our Abba, we thank you for being here this morning in our presence. We thank you for this, your spirit in this house that we felt already this morning with the opening worship when we just praise you for being here with us today. We remember those who were in the hospital this week, who were hospitalized. We're thankful that, that Ken and Carl are home. We pray that you'll just continue their healing. We thank you for being with Dell and Marlene, that you'll just continue to walk with Dell through his struggles and be with him them that they're aware of your presence and feel you there and feel you easing his pain. Lord, we thank you for Selena, that, that Selena was able to go to Puerto Rico to travel during this time and be with her mother in the last day and we uh, just celebrate her mother's life and we Ask that you'll be with Carlos and Selena, with Sylvan and Connie, 
as they travel home in the next few days that you will give them safe travels. Uh, and we just praise you for, for their presence with us. Father, we ask that you'll be with Miriam and Randy and Barb and their children and their siblings and the grandchildren as they come together this afternoon to both mourn Oliver's passing and to celebrate his life of service as a, as a father and a grandfather, as a pastor, as someone who spent his life dedicated to you and, and sharing your word. We just ask that you'll, you'll be here for the service this afternoon for the celebration of his life that, that they'll feel your presence today and, and in the coming weeks. Father, we recognize those unspoken requests this morning. Those who stood, those who may have wanted to stand, those who are sitting here knowing that they have something on their minds, something this week, those who are at home, who have something on their mind and need you, we just, you know what they are. You know all of them. And we just pray that you'll be with those, be with all of us as we go throughout the next days and week that, that we'll feel your presence and feel you working. Lord, we pray for Revive School, for Sylvan and Connie and, and all of those working to share your gospel and your teaching and provide the school to so many countries around the world. We ask that you'll be with them as they partner with, with churches, with individuals to keep expanding, that you'll lead their translation, that they'll be able to just keep sharing your word around the world and educating and, and expanding into more countries and opening, and that you'll open doors for them to continue to do that. Lord, we pray for our pastors and our spouses and lay leaders and those of the Ivana churches as they come together this week here at Clinton Frame for Flourishing, that you will provide them rest and renewal and just renewing relationships with each other in a time to just relax and instead of leading worship, to just be a part of worship and to, to just sit and refresh and renew uh, as leaders. Finally, Lord, we thank you for being with us. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being in this room. I feel your presence this morning in the opening worship, and I ask that you just fill this room, fill those hearts of those leading and those, and those who are worshiping, uh, and those who are worshiping at home, that we just feel you this morning and engage and, and come away knowing that you truly are our God. We ask all these things and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have a couple announcements this morning, uh, and I mentioned it during the prayer. Ivana Flourishing is this week. Uh, typically, it's a pastor spouse retreat in February. It was delayed a little bit this year, uh, and we're now at a point where they are comfortable having that under guidelines, of course. Here at Clinton Frame, there will be quite a few pastors and spouses, lay leaders gathering for worship services on Thursday night at 7, Friday morning, Friday evening, Saturday morning, Saturday evening. The morning sessions are at 9 a.m., the evening sessions, worship services are at 7 p.m., and as a congregation, you're invited to join. So please come out for all of those or any of those. Um, I have seen what's lined up, and I'm sure you will enjoy and remember the experience in worship. And finally, this week, uh, you received an email, and there were some letters sent out that were the 2020, so the past year's, Missional Funding Plan Annual Report. Stewardship and Finance included a letter uh, that 
recapped last year. It's a much different letter than you would normally get uh, with that annual report. It recapped last year, and it looks forward to things that will be happening the rest of this year in 2021. So please take a few moments to read that. If you want a hard copy, there are hard copies uh, in the church office on the counter. At this time, Cliff, would you come forward? Let's, uh, and we'll move to our offering. While Cliff is coming, there are several ways that you can engage with us and, and in the act of worship by giving. Uh, there are boxes in the foyer for your offerings. Uh, you can obviously mail your offerings to us. Uh, you can give at clintonframe.org. Uh, or we can also set up automatic withdrawals for you through clintonframe.org or through the church office. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for providing for us, knowing that it's your church, and it's your work that we're doing, and that if it's your will and your plan, you will provide. And we thank you for providing so generously, and we thank you for all those who who are your means of providing for your work and for outreach and for all of the things that, that we do as a church. We thank you in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. As we continue uh, just worshiping and singing, um, just a reminder that uh, we have the prayer wall open. You are welcome anytime to go up there, write a prayer. Uh, maybe God's speaking something to your heart do that during our singing time or um, the message may prompt you in some way as well. So um, I invite you to stand as we sing It Is Well With My Soul. Sort of a beloved hymn we haven't sung in a while here that I think just really um, will connect with your hearts this morning.
mercy is born. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is born. What love to remember Have you ever prayed really hard for something? Maybe it was for your grandma who was sick, or for your dad to get a good job, or even just to make a new friend at school. And then the next day you prayed for it again, and again, and again, but God never seemed to answer. Didn't it feel like your prayers were just bouncing off the ceiling? Well, you're not the only one. King David prayed a prayer just like that in Psalm 13. Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? David was sad about something. Maybe it's because another king was out to get him. Or because his people wanted someone else to be their leader. Or maybe he just lost his favorite slingshot. But whatever the reason, David felt like God had forgotten all about him. When he prayed in bed at night, he probably thought his prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. Sometimes God is quiet when we need him most. That's what we learn when we read Psalm 13. God didn't always answer David's prayers right away, and he won't always answer your prayers right away. Do you know why? Because he's God and we're not. That's the main reason. If we were God, we could tell him what to do. We could order him around like a little brother, but we're not, so we can't. But if you keep reading Psalm 13, you'll learn something else. Just because God is quiet doesn't mean he's not there. That's what King David learned. 
He realized that God was always watching and always cared. God wasn't mad at David, and he wasn't trying to ignore him. Maybe he just wanted David to learn how to be patient. Maybe God was just trying to teach David how to trust him. And maybe that's why God isn't always answering your prayers. So how can we know he cares? God proved his love by sending Jesus. You remember that famous verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. <sighs> Jesus is God's proof that he's listening, even when our prayers don't feel like they're getting anywhere. Because Jesus died for us, we can know that everything is going to be okay. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. Next time you feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling, try a different prayer. Thank God for saving you. That's what King David did. I was so anxious to preach this morning, and I uh, got up here sooner than I needed to. But it was good to see it close up. And um, let me quickly give an update, because some of you have asked before we get into the message this morning, uh, where we are with the searches. And I would tell you to continue to pray. Um, exciting days are ahead of us as we consider a candidate for the outreach missional position. Uh, really excited about the possibility of, of that individual. Uh, we'll be meeting with him for interviews coming up shortly. So please be in prayer for that. And for the youth pastor position, we met this week and we are down to four, three, potentially four candidates uh, to move forward into an interview process. So again, please uh, be in prayer for that position. And for the family life pastor, uh, again, uh, wondering what God is doing, but at peace with it because uh, we've only had a handful of applications and um, uh, none of them really uh, fit the requirements or the job description that we're looking at. So, But I'm excited that if we can fill those other two positions, we can move forward and fulfilling our mission of making and launching disciples of Jesus to transform our world uh, starting here in our own county. So that's just an update, but also an invitation to continue to pray as, as we move forward through the process. Someone once said that there are two things you can be certain about in life. And we've probably all heard the statement many times, and we know that it's death and taxes. But I'd like to add a third event that we can be certain about and that's suffering going through trials going through difficulties and going through a season of sensing that God is not there and in the sense of being overwhelmed emotionally mentally physically with a sense of pain and I can tell you personally these last 14 months I have suffered not just because of COVID but if we have a picture up here, I can show you that um, last December, December 26th, we, or I was fortunate enough to go up first, and there's our first grandchild on my left with my son, and Lydia is 24 hours old. And now, about a week ago, she is... 14 months old. You can take it down. I don't, I don't want to see it anymore. It's, it's too disturbing. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm grateful for the weekly uh, FaceTime that we have. Um, every Saturday morning or afternoon, we get to spend about an hour FaceTiming. But it's not the same. In fact, it's bittersweet. Uh, in the moment, it's great. We get to see her move around and see how she's developed in the last 14 months. Any of you who are grandparents, especially your first grandchild, you know what this feels like. It's like tormenting. Because when we hang up the phone, well, let me tell you that this weekend, even with the snow still on the ground, I had to go out in the backyard and light a fire and sit, sit by the fire and just, and just process, just lament. And it's tongue-in-cheek, it's humorous, but it also 
is an example of what it feels like when you feel like you've had a loss. When you feel like it hasn't been going well. Day after day, week after week, month after month. All of us can identify with COVID. But beyond that, many of us have events in our lives that are causing emotional, mental, or physical pain. And we wonder, like David, like the video, how long, oh God. I asked that yesterday afternoon by the fire pit. How much longer? We joke because our third son, Josh, and his wife are expecting. And when we found out, we joked and said, we'll probably see this little one before we see Lydia again. And they're expecting in about six weeks. And now it's not that funny because I think that's what's going to happen. I, um, I've, I've talked to Norm and I've talked to a few other people that I'm willing to pay you a substantial amount of money to fly me up into Canada, way up north where we won't be detected, and then I'll make my way down to Toronto. And uh, no one's bid on that yet, and it's probably wise that they haven't. Um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't end well, I'm sure. Psalm 13 is where we want to go today. And we started last week in the Psalms, and we started, of course, logically with Psalm 1. And now we're going to look at a psalm that would be categorized as a psalm of lament, a psalm of suffering and how I respond to my suffering. Starting at verse 1. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praises, for he has been good to me. That's the same psalm, by the way, and, and we'll get into it. But it's a real contrast from where he starts to where he ends. I did some digging around, and, and most scholars suggest that this psalm was written during the time of, from when he was first anointed king, and that season of when he was being pursued by Saul. So if you look at 1 Samuel, starting at chapter 16 and, and going through probably about 10 or 12 chapters, which would represent about 15 to 20 years of David's life, Psalm 6, uh, excuse me, 1 Samuel 16 is he begins by being anointed the next king of Israel. It would be like one of us, nice, kind human beings, just part of this church, good family people, all of a sudden being told that you're going to become the next president of the United States of America. Some of you are frowning like, oh, I don't want to do that, but it was different for David. Remember, David is a shepherd boy. I don't know how many of you remember the story, but he's out in the field when Samuel, the prophet, comes to his dad's house, Jesse, and says, one of your sons, God has told me, is going to be the next king of Israel. So bring in your oldest son, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. No, it's not him. No, it's not him. No, it's not him. And Samuel asks, Jesse, do you have any other boys, any other sons? And he says, well, I have one more, just a little whippersnapper. He's just a young teenager. He's taking care of the sheep. Bring him in. And there, David, one minute is tending sheep. And the next he finds out he's going to be the king of Israel. You talk about winning the lottery. He's on the top of the world. Next chapter, we get the story of David and Goliath. 
And here he is. He's already a little, little uh, probably arrogant, a little cocky, thinking he's going to be the next king. He shows up because his dad sends him to check on his brothers to make sure everything's okay because they're in this battle with the Philistines. And he gets there and he goes, hey, what's going on? And his brothers say, there's this giant. And David does what? We know the story if we grew up in church. David says, well, I can handle this guy. And his brothers get jealous and arrogant and resentful. But Saul, the king, in that moment says, well, if there's some fool who wants to go out there and take him on, then better him than me. And so he sends him out there, and I love the story, because young, naive, but full of faith, David says, you come before me, giant, with your spear, with your javelin, with your sword, but I come before you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. And as he's saying that, I can just visualize, you know the story, swinging that thing, and I'm going to shoot, well, I'm going to turn around here because I don't want anyone to think I'm shooting at them. So he lets it go, nails them, down he goes. To make a long story short, the people, the crowd, go wild. Uh, be like scoring an overtime goal in the National Hockey League playoffs for the Stanley Cup. I've always visualized it doing that. That's why I use that example. But it would be like in the last second you get the victory and the crowd goes nuts. There in the valley, the news spreads quickly back to Jerusalem, capital city of Israel, and Saul asks for David and he's excited, it's wonderful, he's so glad and he brings David in with him and they march into Jerusalem together. And then Saul hears this terrible song. And this is when everything switches for David. People start singing, it says, that, yay, I won't sing, but here are the words. Yay, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. Yay, yippee, hurrah. And Saul, almost immediately, it says in the Bible, that he went from so appreciative of David to i got to kill this guy. i got to get him out of the way. He's a threat. And for the next 10 or 12 chapters or the next 15 or so years of David's life, he is in hiding for his life. And someone suggested, one of the commentaries suggested, he might have been writing this psalm in the very moment when he was hiding in a cave, fearful, of Saul's army. Now you talk about suffering. One minute you're in the top of the world, you're going to be the next king of Israel. You don't know when it's going to happen, but you probably assume it's going to happen in a nice gentle transition. And then you become the most popular person in the country because you've slain the giant. And in the twinkling of an eye now, you are hiding for your life. How long, O oh Lord? 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 Four times he asked the question. Some people think he's just asking it out of frustration and anger, but there is a process that he's going through as he asked the question, how long, O oh Lord, will you hide your face? How long will you forget me? And there's this process of, first of all, all right, maybe, maybe you're busy. I still trust in you. I still believe it's going to be okay, but maybe you're busy, you're preoccupied, so you're forgetting about me right now. You have other important things to do. And then as it wells up in his heart. The next how long is a little bit more deeper and painful because now you haven't forgotten me. It's a matter of you've actually turned 
away from me. How many of us have felt like God has actually heard our prayers, but has turned away? That's painful. And then how long, the third question is, has to do more with him and his struggles and his suffering. And then the last how long has to do with the community. What are people going to think of me? People are going to, in fact, celebrate and think, hey, that arrogant young man, he finally got what he deserved. Or worse, they're going to start saying, huh, he believed in that God, and that God doesn't care. That God is not an active, loving, caring God. I want to challenge us this morning with the idea that many of us, I won't say how many, I'm, I'm not going to speculate, but there are some of us who when we are suffering, when we are struggling, when we are going through a difficult time, often jump to verse 3 of Psalm 13. You see, the way this psalm, it's categorized as a psalm of lament, but I think it starts as a lament with verse 1 and 2. And then verse 3 and 4 is more of a petition. Prayer of petition is when we actually ask God what we need. And we come before God with our concerns. And then verses 5 and 6 are prayers of celebration and faith and joy. And I believe, unfortunately, that many in the church, not just here, but as Christians, we bypass verses 1 and 2. And we go right to, here's what I need. God, here's what I need you to do. And when we bypass one and two, we miss out on what God's trying to do in our lives. And think about this. Don't judge me when I say this. But I wonder if sometimes we don't feel like our prayers are answered because God still wants us to get back to verse 1 and verse 2. Robert Mulholland, a uh, theologian, a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary, uses this phrase that has been used by many others probably 20 or 30 years ago. And a lot of us, especially in counseling or spiritual direction, will say to people, you need to embrace your pain. You need to walk in it and see what God might be trying to teach you about yourself and who you are. And unfortunately, we live in a culture and a society that denies pain and suffering as much as possible. The media, billboards, you have this illness, you have this disorder, you struggle with depression, Take this, and you'll feel fine. And we are brainwashed to think as soon as possible, let's deny and repress the struggle that we have right now and move into feeling good and well again. And so I want to suggest that even in the next few minutes that we stay in this idea of suffering. I may not even get to verse 3 and 4 or 5 and 6. That's easy to do. We can all celebrate and rejoice. But I really want us to sit in verse 1 and 2 and what it means for you and I to suffer. Suffering happens, friends, because we live in a world that God loved us so much that he created us with free will. Not only us, but the world, nature. We specifically live in a climate that has four seasons. God made the world that way, that it spins 24 hours 
And at the same time, it's spinning around the sun. And we have all these wonderful four seasons, three especially we really like, one that we're in now, some of us can take and leave, but wonderful things happen just naturally because God said it that way. And good or bad, I think it's good personally. God created us with free will. So suffering happens in the world, sometimes because of nature, natural disasters. Sometimes suffering happens because hurt people will hurt people. Sometimes suffering happens because we make bad choices and it influences other people. I mean, suffering happens because God created a world out of his love with free will. Think of the, think of the opposite. If God would have created us as robots and had us all programmed, think of your own human relationships. Think of your marriages. Man, if, if you got married and, and at, at the service, just before the minister said, I pronounce you man and wife, he put a chip in the wife, and now you had, yeah, some of you are looking at me like, oh, wow, maybe that would have, uh, no. We know that maybe for a day or two we would have enjoyed being able to command our spouses. But it wouldn't have been genuine love. We wouldn't have been able to experience the fullness of love. And that's why God created us to be free, to choose, to love him, to serve him, and to love and serve one another. But we are humans that still struggle. And so suffering happens because sometimes we made bad choices. We make poor choices. But I want to tell you that in suffering... God reaches out to us. C.S. Lewis in the book, A Grief Observed, it's a book about his life with his wife and then her death. C.S. Lewis was single for about 55 years. And at the age of 55, finally, this brilliant scholar falls in love with Joy Davidson. And they're married. And three years into the marriage, she gets diagnosed with cancer. And within a year, she dies. And so C.S. Lewis journals or psalms his experience of being at the top of the world, falling in love, and then within four years it snatched from him. And he says this. He says, when life is going well, we hear God possibly with one ear. But it's the, in the midst of suffering, we experience God with our whole being. When things are going well, we might hear God trying to speak to us with one ear, he says. But in the midst of our suffering, we experience God with our entire being. In the midst of suffering, it's when we're the most attentive. In the midst of our suffering, it's when we're the most motivated to see God. It's when we're in trouble. And we might have been listening maybe with one ear in the trouble, in the trial, in the struggle. Now we're saying, how long? How long? How long? How much longer? Heal me. Deliver me. Answer that prayer. And God says, I love you so much. Let's sit in this for a while. Because I want you to grow and mature. I want you to experience me in a deeper way that you never would any other way. Unless I allow you to go through this, that will motivate you to draw closer to me. So let me end with, with two principles, I think, that help us understand why God allows us to suffer. Beyond free will and the choices we make, in the midst of our suffering, I think God says, James chapter 1, 
God doesn't say those words, but I'm saying in James chapter 1, we read, consider it pure joy. I'll be honest with you, I am not there yet. As I'm missing Lydia, I don't do cartwheels. I don't jump up and down and say, yay, I don't get to see her, yay. But what I'm realizing is the pure joy is now I get to experience God's presence more. Because let me tell you, I seek God like never before. And then this is what I hear. Because it says in James chapter 1, consider pure joy because it's going to help you grow and mature because you're going to learn to persevere. And perseverance builds character. Why can't I build character by just reading my Bible every day and by praying every day? Because that's not how we're wired. And so when something bad happens to us, God says, draw near to me. Listen to me. I have something to say to you about what you're going through. You have these issues. You have these character defects. You are impatient. And friends, be careful. I've said this before. Be careful asking God to make you more patient. Because what will happen? God will allow you to be in a situation where you can respond impatiently, frustrated, angry, or, okay. And whatever it means for you to learn patience. Repeat a verse about patience. Count to ten. Start singing. Before you put your hand on that horn in your car because that guy passed you. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you'll, you'll understand what I was saying. But God wants to build us up and build character in our lives and make us more like him. And until he breaks us, until he's able to remove some of that stuff in us that makes us selfish, judgmental, arrogant, angry, then that's the process that he takes us through. Secondly and lastly, I think God allows us to suffer, to go through circumstances because then we're able to minister to other people. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 to 4. It says, and the comfort that you'll eventually receive from God as you're going through difficult times is the comfort that you can share with other people when they're going through difficult times. I mean, if it does nothing for me, the fact that I become more empathetic that I become more compassionate, that I become more caring of others. Listen, anyone who misses their grandchildren, let's start a small group and we can get together and man, we will support each other because we all feel the same pain. And so if it's for no other reason that you're going through what you're going through, Perhaps it's because God is trying to form in you some traits that will allow you to minister to those around you. I think I've shared this before and I'll say it one more time because it bears repeating. When I was in seminary starting the counseling program, I remember that first day when the professor said, the most important trait, quality, gift that you need to be a good counselor is empathy. <clears throat> Period. Next sentence. We cannot teach empathy. Empathy is your own experience of pain and sorrow and suffering that allows you to be not just sympathetic, but empathetic. 
Sympathetic is, yeah, I'm sorry you're going through that. Hope you feel better soon. Empathetic is, man, I've suffered similar to what you're suffering. And I'm beside you. I'm with you. I want to encourage you. And when we talk about letting our light shine, when we talk about making a difference, comforting one another is a way that we can reach out to one another. I want to give us opportunity this morning, even as, we're, as we close, I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And I want us to actually have the opportunity to practice embracing our pain. And so we're going to, the worship team is going to lead us in a couple of songs. And as they begin, uh, Pastor Linda and Julie will be over here by the prayer wall. And we want to invite you, I'll be over here by the piano. And we want to invite you, if, if you want prayer, and in fact, if you want anointing for what you might be suffering with, we want you to come. And we will anoint you and pray with you during this season of suffering. If you want to come to the prayer wall and write down a prayer like Psalm 13, a psalm or a lament, then the prayer wall is open as well. But let's take the next few minutes as we sing and worship together to take this opportunity to bear one another's burdens and support one another and care for one another. Father, we just give you these next few minutes. And we pray that beyond any words that you've given me to share today, that your spirit would just touch the hearts and the lives of those that need to be honest and open with themselves, perhaps for the first time, and be able to embrace the opportunity to receive prayer and to lament and share their prayer. Lord, take these moments in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, send us forth this morning in the midst of our questioning, how long? With your spirit encouraging us with a new level of trust and to move forward like David did with songs in our heart and trusting and believing in our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. God bless.